Hey guys, personal safety is what we're talking about today um, in travel, with regard to travel. Personal safety and accountability is always having an entrance and an exit plan, whether it's at home, at the airport, in a restaurant, a foreign country, doesn't matter. You gotta have an in, you gotta have an out. And there are things you can do with travel that um, will help you maintain personal safety despite the restrictions that are placed on you by your travel by like TSA and other places that kind of strip you of tools. So start with before you travel. The first step in protecting yourself or your loved ones at home or on the road is having a plan. And maybe that looks like carrying a firearm for you or an edge weapon or being proficient in combatives, which is just fighting. Um, all while being able to remain calm, think, react and communicate effectively and appropriately. Whatever tool you select, whatever tool you select, it's important that you identify that protective resource and that you train that thing consistently. If it's firearms, you may make sure you know how to shoot. If it is fighting, make sure you do it regularly. Put it in, put in the reps so it's a natural part of you, right? You don't want to just kind of hope you're going to figure this out on the day of. So the next thing is packing. Let's pack smartly. Your carry-on ought to be something that, something with which you can move quickly. And a roller bag just, it isn't that. I mean, you can't. Uh, you need a backpack uh, or a crossbody shoulder bag or both, really. That's what I use, and that works great for me. I throw the bat on. I've got my shoulder bag in front with my comms and my ID and my money. And your hands are free, and you can run if you need to. Uh, choose good shoes also. Bring a battery bank so that when you land, your phone is fully charged. Bring adapters for local outlets if you're going overseas. Now, I mentioned firearms, so let's talk about how to fly with one real quick. Uh, if I'm traveling domestically, I'm going to carry a firearm, a uh, concealed pistol, um, maybe a rifle, depending on what I'm doing for teaching the class, obviously I'll carry that. Whether I'm flying or I'm driving, though, I'm carrying a gun. If it's a flight, once I land, I collect my luggage and my gun box, and I go straight to the nearest bathroom stall, I load magazines, and then I leave the airport with a properly loaded weapon, concealed. Um, go to the garage, pick up my rental car, whatever, but I'm, I'm armed. And flying with a gun isn't as hard as you might think. You get a locked gun case and enough locks and you pack it, right? A uh, gun box might have two lock holes. You got to get two locks. Can't have one. They'll ding you for it. Have all your ammo separated from the magazines and in the original boxes. No loaded mags. Each airline's got their own rules, but generally no loaded magazines and maybe not more than 11 pounds of ammo, maybe a total weight of not more than 50 pounds in the box itself, unless you want to pay an overweight fee. I also personally lock the bolt and the slides to the rear and the weapons in the open position so they can look at it and see it. it makes it faster for me. Um, I'll also put any edge weapons I want to take in that gun box so everything is in one place once I land. Lastly, I, I put an air tag in my check bags and my gun box, whether it's a gun box or not. I just throw an air tag in there just so I can track my bags and know where they are at all times. Once you packed, you take your check bags to the check bag check-in area um, they'll uh, the flight person will ask you open it up you'll open it they'll get you to fill out a form declaring everything's unloaded and then you'll lock the box you'll keep the key it goes to TSA hang out and wait for TSA to scan it this time you take is going to work to your benefit because usually they'll come out and tell you it's good to go and you get on your flight but take this extra step and then board your plane because you don't want to get where you're going and find out your bags didn't make it because there was something wrong with your gun box. They're going to give you luggage tags just like any other piece of check bags. Make sure you hang on to it. If you don't, you're going to have a hard time collecting your gear. Speaking of, you land on the other side. The gun box should be taken directly by luggage personnel to the lost luggage office. It should not come out on the conveyor belt. 
And this is safety to keep somebody from just walking off with your gun. So you go to the lost luggage office, you show them your ID, you show them your bag tag, and you collect your firearm. Now this process is only for domestic travel. Don't, don't try this that I just described internationally or you're gonna end up in trouble. If you're going internationally and taking a gun, maybe you're going on a safari hunt or something, who knows? That's a separate form. It's a CBP, that's Charlie Bravo Papa 4457, Customs Border Protection, I think. And that's just a form declaring your personal items and they know now what you're taking overseas and they'll make sure you come back with it and that you didn't take it over and sell it or give it away. So that's guns, all right? Now let's continue with our planning and our prep for a safe trip. The next thing you want to do is research your destination. Get online, look at reviews of the hotel, check out maps and satellite imagery of the streets and the surrounding areas. Make sure your hotel's not, you know, backed up to a slum or something. Um, you're looking for uh, good, good neighborhoods in general and just to know the streets and the layout and how the hotel looks as you're approaching. Um, you know, check that thing out real good from all angles. Then check crime stats and the latest happenings in the area so you don't land in the middle of political upheaval like the Arab Spring. The UK Foreign Office has got a great website on destinations. They cover a lot of things that you might uh, be interested in on terrorism, crime, transportation, medical, and all that. Better than our State Department, i got to say. When you do land, make sure you have cell signal. As you're exiting your airplane, pop that phone on, make sure you can get a signal. If you don't, first, go get you some local money currency, convert some currency, get some money for tips and from cabs, and then buy a local SIM card, buy prepaid minutes on that card and get it going before you leave the airport. Do not exit the airport without a way to communicate with other people. Even if that means getting your luggage and just sitting down and fixing this, but don't go out without having a way to talk or text. Now you exit the airport. If you got a driver meeting you, tell them not to have a sign with their name on it. Make up a fake name. Agree to it ahead of time. Make a three-digit number uh, or a three sets of letters that everybody knows. And then that way you come down and you can just say it, see it and go to it. And you didn't just tell everybody in the world who you are. If you're hailing a cab, do not take the first cab that comes up to you and chooses you. They're looking for wild-eyed tourists who just got off a long flight. They're going to come up to you and just say, hey, get in my cab. And, you know, no. Instead, you choose the cab. You make the choice. You look out there and say, I want that one. Always stay in control of decisions that affect you and your group. You don't know that might not be a real cab driver. It might just be an opportunistic criminal who takes you somewhere and steals stuff from you. When the cab does arrive, though, look for numbers and labeling on the outside. On the inside, look for a meter, look for a two-way radio and a badge, something that says, hey, this is an official cab. On the way to your hotel from the airport, drop a pin at your airport's location on your phone and then follow the route on your map as you go so you know if you're going to the hotel or maybe you're going to this dude's house you know you you, you don't want to you don't want that these are all tips whether you're domestic travel or international because crooks live everywhere so go ahead and get a plan in place to deal with this let's talk about the hotel hopefully you chose a reputable one uh from a known chain and you requested a room above the third floor we did a video on hotel rooms a few weeks back, and we'll link that in the description below. But, you know, that's going to be a safe bet if you go with something along those lines. Record that hotel's address and contact information somewhere you can get to it easily once you arrive. And the same goes for your credit card, your passport, your ID in general. Keep them secure, zipped up, but accessible to you. Fumbling through your personal belongings creates distractions. You're distracted. You are distracted. And it's opportunities for human predators. They're watching, where is that person going for their money? Do they know what they're doing? Do they look like they're a good traveler or these are novices? Keep it handy and get to it quickly. Uh, the rest of the video is gonna be on the airport and your aircraft. When you're in the airport and you're going through security, be prepared. If you gotta take shoes off, your laptop, or things have to be removed, Prep that stuff in line and stage it easily so they can be done quickly and you can put things in a bin for inspection and move through. One, it's aggravating everybody behind you if you're the guy that doesn't have to untie his shoes. But two, it just helps you get moving quicker. Once you're on the other side of that scanner, collect all your items, move away from the area, and put on your shoes and repack your bag. 
get out of the area because you never know what can happen, especially in a third world airport in a tightly packed space. And being away from it just increases your personal safety if somebody were to start shooting or set something off in that in that area. There. So get away from congested spots like that. The same goes for your gate. Get close enough to hear and see announcements, but get far enough away to be out of that mass of people that are jammed into that one area. And along those same lines, try to stand near a wall or a support column if you can. Uh, if an explosion were to occur, that ceiling, that roof might just pancake and collapse, trapping under people underneath. And if you're near a column or a wall, it might give you a pocket of safety from getting flattened. And it also, you know, it cuts in half what you have to keep an eye on if you have a wall to your back. Now you just got 180 to worry about instead of 360. Now, when it's time to board, check out the door frame of the airplane as you walk on board. A lot of times, if you'll look about head high on the left in that door frame, you'll see a label that'll tell you the make, model, and year your aircraft was built. And this maybe can provide you some comfort or concern, depending on how old your airplane is and who made it. If you're flying Pakistani International Airways, we used to call it prayers in air. As you walk on board, scan the sea of faces and do it in a friendly way, not like you're coming to punch somebody in the head, but just look at everybody. And if you put your bags in an overhead bin, maybe think about putting that in a bin across from your seat that you can see from your seat. It's easier to get to and you can keep an eye on it mid-flight so you know nobody's just rifling through your stuff and you don't know it. Speaking of flights, if my flight's under two hours, I take an aisle. And speaking of the aisle seat, you can make life a lot easier for yourself getting in and out of an aisle seat by just lifting that armrest using a little hidden button underneath. People don't know about this a lot of times, but you can lift that thing and it makes it a lot easier for sliding in and out of that aisle seat. If my flight is longer than two hours, I'll take a window because I want to use the bulkhead. I want to use that wall and try to get some snooze. So there. And if your plane's hijacked too, you're away from the aisle. You're not getting punched in the head by the bad guys. So let's talk about that. Problems on board the aircraft. What would you do if there were problems on board your airplane? Think about it. The first thing you need to decide is what sort of problem am I, am I dealing with? Just like you do if you were back on earth, driving your vehicle, getting gas, you know, whatever, and something occurred near you, you have to figure out and they say, do I want to jump in the middle of this? Is it an argument between two people not connected to me or my people with me? Maybe I'm just going to leave that to the airline staff. That man might not be my calling at that moment. Is it a drunk person bothering somebody? Again, airline staff are trained to handle this kind of junk. Normally, normal junk. But if you have, but, but you have to decide when and if you should intervene. And you need to really think it through. You got legal implications. You've got, um, I mean, safety of your to yourself too. But there's one scenario that you truly need to think about: a hijacking. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have heard of um, one guy's idea on living through a hijacking. So this guy's on board and terrorists take over the airplane. They've, gotten, they've taken control of everything. Terrorist says, everybody be quiet or I'll kill you. And then he points to this person over here and says, what's your name? You, you there, what's your name? It's a woman. She says, my name is Susan. Terrorist says, Susan, you will stay alive. My mom's name is Susan. So you get to live. He looks over there and he says, hey, you, what's your name? This is a dude now. Dude's name's Peter. He says, my name's Peter, but my friends call me Susan. Okay, probably not ever going to help you in any way at all, just for fun here. But back to reality. First, just like you do in the middle of the night, if you hear a noise, you're not going to jump up, grab your pistol, and go clear the house just because you heard the house squeak or you heard something in the house. You're going to lie there and let the situation develop a little bit, hear it maybe twice, and then jump into Batman mode. If air marshals are on board, they're going to handle this problem. And if you get involved, it's going to complicate their life and your and their job and probably get you shot. But if nobody's doing anything and you decide you need to, there are options available to you. As with any fight, you need a plan and a way to execute it. And your plan is simple. Defend the cockpit so the pilot can land the plane. That's your plan. 
defend the cockpit so the pilot can put the plane on the ground safely. If you don't, and the bad guys get inside, the options start to suck, and the whole situation is going to go north quickly. And yes, I said north. I'm from the south. Going south is amazingly good. Going north for a southerner, hmm. Okay, back to the reality here. The hijackers will either crash the plane, think 9-11, or they're going to force it to land in some friendly place to them, unfriendly to you, and your life changes into being a hostage. Like I said, life's going to start to suck. The other alternative, here's another one, is that a government decides to not take the risk of another 9-11 and they shoot your plane out of the sky. It's possible. It is a standing um, plan in many countries. So how do you defend the cockpit? I mean, you're in an airplane. You're in a confined space. If you start this fight, you're in a tube 30,000 feet in the air. There's nowhere to run if you decide to bail out of the fight. You've got to win the fight. For either you're going to die or the plane's going to be in a bad spot. Really bad spot, maybe. So what do you have on board the plane to help you fight? First, you need weapons, and you're going to have to improvise. I want you to think medieval. I want you to think a mace and a shield. And I'm not talking spray mace. Think William Wallace mace. First, the mace. Your seat belts are connected to the seat with a D-ring that hooks into a ring attached to the frame. Unhook that, slide one end down to the hook, wrap your hand around the strap, and now you've got a mace. <laughs> The shield is just your seat. Rip it up. It's Velcroed down. Run your hand through the strap that they use to help you hold on in case it goes in the water. Now you've got a shield and you've got a mace where you can attack. Other weapons on board are pins, pencils, the divider curtain, ceramic plates from the forward cabin, uh, broken into an edge weapon, uh, a comb, your keys, even throwing carry-on bags from the overhead bins in a pinch. That curtain, you just rip that thing off, straighten it out, and now you got a choker, a uh, garrote, you, you know, choke somebody out with it. The pilot might also be able to help you, too, by putting that plane into a steep dive and throw everybody off balance. Uh, or, depending on the aircraft, like this 777, they can depressurize the cabin, knock everybody out from lack of oxygen. It won't help you, but it'll help lay everybody out until you put the plane on the ground. Finally, look, you know, it's not a good situation, but the current odds of being in a flight hijacked by terrorists are 10,408,000. 1,947 to 1. Similarly, there's a 1 in 11 million chance that you'll die in a plane crash. But the odds of dying in a car crash are 1 in 5,000. You do that every day, multiple times a day. So the odds are in your favor. Just be vigilant, plan ahead, and have a plan. But remember what Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So have a backup plan. Guys, thanks for listening. I hope you have a good uh, good rest of your week. Get your reps in. Get your PT in. Train, train, train. Love on that thing.